Hey guys, my name is Mike, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about diphtheria toxin. So uh, there's a lot of material to cover, but I think you guys will enjoy it, and so I'm just going to get right into it. Just let me get my laser pointer. So diphtheria toxin is a protein produced by pathogenic Corymbacterium diphtheriae strains. It is a single polypeptide made of 535 amino acids, and it is an AB toxin, meaning that there's a B subunit and an A subunit, and the B subunit is involved with recognition and transmission of the cell, of the toxin, into the cell, and the A subunit is what's meant for causing damage. Um, there are three different domains that make up the two different fragments. There's an N-terminal C domain, a middle T domain, and a C-terminal R domain. This, thus, the protein is Y-shaped, and the C domain contains the A fragment, and the T and R domains make up the B fragment. So the T and R domains are um, used for cell recognition and transfer. So here's a Ramachandran plot. The, this mostly right-handed alpha helixes and the beta sheets, as you can see from the phi psi angles of the protein. And there are a few left-handed alpha helices, but these alpha helices and beta sheets are actually very important in the mechanism of the cell, which we'll talk about. Okay, so here's a ribbon structure of the protein. I have one from a paper and one from a PDB file. Um, I've colored beta sheets in yellow and alpha helices in pink for the remainder of the presentation. So we can see here that this is the catalytic domain. This is the C domain. This is the R domain, which is used in receptor binding and recognition. And this is the T domain, which facilitates transport across the cellular membrane. And all of these domains are, are useful in the... Um, in the protein's mechanism. And here we can see a PSL, which is a protease-sensitive loop. This protease-sensitive loop is actually very integral to the function of the protein, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But you can kind of see it here too. It's right here on the outside. So the R domain is the first domain we're going to talk about because it's the first involved in interacting with the cell. It's formed by two beta sheets linked by hydrogen bonds. And these beta sheets form a beta barrel, like we talked about in class, and, and it's very prominent in nature. This motif is analogous to immunoglobulin molecules, which are very, very frequently found in cells. And thus, this is the mechanism of binding. Because it's so common, the cell has a receptor that's, that's used to recognize it. So we can see here, I've turned this PDB on its side, and uh, you can see the barrel structure here. And I've juxtaposed it to an immunoglobulin beta barrel, so you can guys kind of see the... Um, the similarities between the two. Um, it, they're not exactly the same, but the hydropho their hydrophobic surfaces on the inside are what actually cause the, the molecule to be recognized, which I find very, very fascinating. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I just wanted to give you a juxtaposition of the R domain to the immunoglobulin molecules to show the similarities. The next thing we're going to talk about is the T domain of the protein. This is the transmembrane domain of the protein, and it it's entirely alpha helical. Many of these alpha helices are hydrophobic, and thus we can conclude that they are trans transmembrane activities. There are three layers of helices with two hydrophobic layers and one hydrophilic layer, and we'll talk about the hydrophilic layer in a little bit. Uh, the hydrophilic and hydrophobic layers create a pore, which allows the C domain, which carries the catalytic activity necessary for uh, destruction of the cell. Uh, this, this pore allows the C domain to pass through and cause damage. Uh, so here you can see all these alpha helices. Um, there's, there's just so many of them. And that's why we can conclude that this is the transmembrane portion along with their hydrophobic character. So lastly, we're going to talk about the C domain. This is two perpendicular beta sheet subdomains that form the core of the protein. And these subdomains are surrounded by alpha helices. Subdomains are connected by loops, which gives them flexibility and shape, and that kind of is important in the mechanism of entry, which we'll talk about a little bit later. The C domain contains the catalytic activity, and this is where the protein binds nicotinamide, which is one of the ways that it catalyzes a reaction in the cell that causes you know, cell death. Uh, it contains the active site, and it can only activate after the R domain has been removed, which we'll get into in a little bit, but I just thought it was an interesting little preview of the mechanism of the toxin. It's linked to the T domain by disulfide bonds, which is also important in the mechanism of the protein. Here we can see the C domain bound to a nicotinamide thing, molecule. The nicotinamide molecule is, in its, is smack in the center of the, uh, the C domain, and if we can juxtapose it with this, this picture, the nicotinamide would be here, which would cause some steric conflicts with binding because of the R region being so large and in the way. Thus, it makes sense that by removing the R domain, we can activate the catalytic portion of the molecule. The overall toxin mechanism is as follows. The B subunit, made up of the R and T domains, binds to the cell receptors on the outside of the cell membrane. The A domain is then translated into the cell, where it catalyzes a reaction with elongation factor 2 found in eukaryotic protein synthesis. 
this modified elongation factor 2 cannot interact with the ribosome in the way that it needs to. Thus, protein synthesis comes to a halt, and no more proteins can be made for the cell to live. So the cell dies. Begin. And so here I have a little picture of uh, the, the mechanism of entry. The yellow subunit is the R domain, the green subunit is the T domain, and the red subunit is the C domain. So we can see that this is recognized by this receptor here, and the receptor binds to the R domain and then is endocytosis into this little vacuole. And here we can see ATPase, and as it performs its function, it acidifies these, this medium and causes the change in the T domain to insert itself into the membrane. After it's inserted, because the C domain is attached, the R domain is cleaved and the C domain moves through, where the disulfide bonds holding it to the T domain are reduced. And after they are reduced, the C domain is free to catalyze the reaction of forming an ADPR ribosylation reaction with elongation factor 2. And this is, of course, the catalytic function of the, the protein. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the mechanism of catalysis of the enzyme. In the active site of the enzyme, the C domain catalyzes ADP ribosylation of EF2. Now that's a big scary word, but all it means is that the ADP ribose from NAD plus is attached to a, a residue in the EF2 um, protein. This shuts down function because it can no longer interact with the tRNA in the ribosome, thus no protein synthesis can occur and the cell goes through apoptosis. And this is the overall reaction, and this, this is kind of significant in, in, uh, in and of itself, because we'll talk about this a little bit in inhibition. Um, the EF2 NAD turns into ADP ribose EF2 plus nicotinamide plus H+. Plus. So nothing's actually modified, they're just separated uh, by the catalytic mechanism of the enzyme. So the way that it does this is a glutamine 140, no, not glutamine, glutamic acid 148 in the active site of the CETO. It forms a stable bond with a nicotinamide group of NAD+. And because it does this, the ADP ribose becomes a very favorable leaving group. And because it's a leaving group, it can now be free to attack this diphthamid residue in, in um, EF2. And it's not quite sure what diphthamid does in EF2, but cells with site-directed mutagenesis at the diphthamid residue have very, very decreased protein function. So it, it's likely that it's used in some form of control or regulation of EF2. But here we talk about um, ADP ribose attacking the diphthamid residue and forming the complex that inactivates it. So that concludes my presentation on diphtheria toxin. I know it was a little lengthy, but I hope you guys enjoyed it, and I think it covered most of the bases with the protein. Um, thanks, guys, for sticking with me, and I hope you